Today we're continuing our series on the church. And last Sunday, we saw from Acts chapter 1 that Jesus instructed his disciples to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so in last week's passage, Jesus, he ascended into heaven, but he does not leave his disciples alone. He did not leave his followers alone, and we saw that. And that the disciples would be indwelt, meaning the Holy Spirit would come and live within them. He would empower them to do his mission, to perform and to carry out his mission here on earth. And if you have Jesus, then this is the same Holy Spirit that lives within you and me. And so one of the questions that I always ask and I beg you to always ask is, what would compel such a sovereign, amazing, and holy God to want to live inside you and I? What would compel a God to do that? Who are we that God himself would choose to have the gospel reach us? I mean, there's so many barriers between God and us besides sin, which we constantly talk about. Uh, for some, it, it began with language. It began with the, the barrier of location in Jerusalem. And you see God's salvation plan laid out in the New Testament, how is it that it would reach us here in 2013 and that many of us would be saved? And if you don't know Jesus this morning, no, seriously, seriously, we are glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us and if you're just here, you're just trying to check out what Christianity is about or maybe you've been out of church for a while and you're trying to find your way back in, you know, we believe that it is God who has brought you here. So we are truly grateful and our Hope, our prayer is that you would simply find your identity in Christ. Because when God wants to save people, he will break through any barrier to come and live inside your heart. He will break through any barrier, even your pride, your own rejection of Christianity and biblical truth. The Holy Spirit will break through those barriers to reach you for Jesus. And that's what we're going to see this morning. This morning we're in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, there are three narrative breakdowns. We can break down this narrative into three scenes. Three narrative scenes. First, in verse 1 and down in verse 5, I, I want you to see the setting. Okay, then we're going to see where the church began. The arrival of the Spirit in verses 2 to 4. Then in verses 6 to 13, you will see the response of the crowd. How did people respond to the beginning of the church? On earth, How did people respond to the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity? So first, let's see the setting. If you don't have your Bible, I mean, if you have your Bibles, please take it and turn with me to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And if your neighbor does not have a Bible, please do share with them. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I want you to first notice the setting. And notice that the church was born of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. In verse 1 it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they, and this day here is referring to 120 Christ followers. They were all together in one place. And we know that this most likely refers to the 120 first group of Christians from Acts chapter 1 verse 15. In Acts chapter 1 verse 15, it says that there were about 120 of Jesus' followers gathered in Jerusalem waiting for the arrival of the Holy Spirit. What's the day of Pentecost? I think it's important uh, to give some background so you understand this setting and why it's important and why it's theologically significant. The day of Pentecost refers to a Jewish festival that was celebrated precisely 50 days after Passover. Penta means five. Pentecost means 50th. 50th. Pentecost referred to another Jewish festival other than Passover, and it took place 50 days after Passover to celebrate the grain harvest, the harvest of wheat. And so in, in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, it refers to this festival as the Feast of Harvest. In Deuteronomy 16, verses 9 to 10, it refers to this Jewish Pentecost as the Feast of Weeks. In Numbers 28, verse 26, it refers to this festival as the day of first fruits. And even though there's different names given, it's describing the same festival, the Jewish Pente uh, Pentecost. 
And in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16, it gives us a nice summary, a nice description of what exactly takes place during this festival. It explains that during this one-day festival, special grain offerings were made to give thanks to God for providing a wheat harvest. And when you take that first batch of grain and offer it up to God, that's what we refer to as the first fruits of God's labor, the first fruits of our labor. God provides, we take that first batch, and we offer it up to God. And why this is theologically significant is that God designed for the Holy Spirit to arrive on the day of Pentecost, the day of first fruits, where these 120 first believers represent the first fruits of spirit filled believers. This is the first fruits of the spiritual harvest of God's new people, the church, who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So that's the first reason why Pentecost was theologically significant. But there's also a second reason that Pentecost was chosen, which is the practical, the practicality of the significance of the day. If you skip down to verse 5, skip down to verse 5 in Acts chapter 2, and I want you to notice that Luke records that Jewish people from all over the Mediterranean world came to this important festival. The Old Testament commands that every true Jewish male attend this festival. And verse 5 says that there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And we believe that when, it's, when it talks about Jews from every nation under heaven, that this is talking about the Jewish diaspora. And basically, Jews were dispersed throughout the Mediterranean world. And during these festivals, these Jewish pilgrims would make the long journey over for Passover. And since it's only 50 days after Passover, it doesn't make sense for them to, you know, pack their horses or camels or whatever and, and travel all the way back to their native lands. But instead, they would camp out in the city. Some of them stayed in inns. Some of them stayed in homes. The majority of them lived in tents, camped either right inside of the city gates or right outside of the city gates. And so, so literally, the population of Jerusalem would swell from about 100,000 inhabitants to around a million people during these festivals. I don't know if you can see this map, but this is the clearest one I could find that gives me copyright uh, permission to release to you. Okay, this is from my Bible software, uh, from the ESV Study Bible. Uh, and just to give you a representation of the Mediterranean world and where they came from. Okay, there were Jews living. What happens is that as early as 586 B.C., under the Babylonian uh, rule, many Jews were exiled and they went to different places. Now, after that, many Jews were permitted to come back to Jerusalem but after generations and generations, they chose to stay. Uh, many of these families became settled, and, and, and the native tongue, their native tongue, they, even though they were Jewish, their native tongue became the tongue of that nation that they settled in, and because generations passed. And so this is the perfect scene. This is the scene where many devout Jews are gathered in one place, and the Holy Spirit's going to arrive, and it's going to fall upon the first 120 Christians as a, as a means to witness to these Jewish pilgrims that gathered in Jerusalem. Now let's look at the second point, which is the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 2, so let's skip back, uh, go back up to Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And notice in verse 2 that the Holy Spirit comes, it says, from heaven. And so last week we explained that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes from heaven. And we see in verse 2 that the coming of the Spirit is compared to a noise, a sound like a mighty, violent, rushing wind. And yesterday in Walnut, it was windy. It was really windy. You know, I was, I was chilling out with David Wong uh, and and Minister Matt, 
at Pyology and, you know, down on, on, on Grand and Amar, and we looked outside, and the, the leaves were blowing, and it was just momentary, and you could kind of hear it. You kind of hear the wind a little bit. Okay, but just imagine something much greater. Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 37, chapter 37, verses 9 to 14, it describes wind. Wind is used as a metaphor to describe God breathing life into dead bodies. And so wind is used in the Old Testament to describe the presence of God as a metaphor. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus himself described the coming of the Holy Spirit as being like wind. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Jesus is making a point. He's saying the divine activity of being born by such a powerful force as the third person of the Godhead is so sudden that even when Jesus warned and told his disciples to anticipate this, they knew the Spirit was coming, they knew what to look out for, who to look out for, but yet they were shocked. They were surprised by just the power and the suddenness of this coming. It made such an impact. It was so unexpected, just like wind. We don't really know where it comes from or where it's going to take, to take its course next, but the effects of a strong wind are clearly seen and observed. Notice in verse 3, it describes this supernatural scene. So first there's this sound of like wind. But then in, notice in verse 3, it says there's tongues that looked like flames of fire. And I don't know if this is literally dancing tongues that look like fire, but it says it looked like fire. It looked like flames of fire appeared and settled on each individual believer. So the Spirit of God is not just dwelling on a camp. It's not just dwelling on a group of people corporately, but the Holy Spirit, God himself, is resting on each individual believer. And this is something new in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, it didn't work this way. God would dwell in a camp among the Israelites. God would dwell. His presence would be represented in a central place in the temple, in the tabernacle. But here, every individual, the Spirit of God himself, comes and rests upon them. And there is an effect, and it's like fire. We know from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, that God appeared to Moses. And when God appeared to Moses, God could have chose any way to appear, and he chooses fire. He chooses to appear to Moses in a burning bush, revealing himself, his presence, to Moses through fire. Exodus 3, 2, it says this, The Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. Later, in the same book, in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, here we are at Mount Sinai. Here we are at Mount Sinai, and it says that Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on Mount, Mount Sinai in fire. So the point is the Lord wanted to manifest his presence to Moses and to Israel. And he chose to show up on Mount Sinai in the form of fire. And so wind, fire, these are Old Testament metaphors and symbols that God chose to reveal himself to his people. Now notice in verse 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Notice that it says they were, um, they were, they were speaking in tongues. And th as the Spirit of God indwelled each believer, they each began to speak intelligible languages. And we're going to get back to this. Okay, that these are intelligible languages is what you want to know. The end of verse 4 makes it clear that it was the Holy Spirit that was giving the, them these verbal utterances. They were speaking foreign languages. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit gave them two or three years of Rosetta Stone. Okay, that's not what it says. It says immediately, immediately they were given, they were given these languages and they were able to speak these foreign languages. And the purpose 
of this manifestation was witness, was evangelism. It's so that they could praise God, so that they can speak of Jesus Christ to these Jewish pilgrims in their native language. Here are 120 Jewish Christians, most of them from Galilee, speaking all sorts of foreign languages. Uh, for example, I don't speak German. I've never used Rosetta Stone. I've never taken German. But the reason I choose German is because for a fact, I know that there are some of you in here who speak German. I know that for a fact, that there are some of you in here who speak German. And if I started speaking German all of a sudden, I don't know, you know, Wiener Schnitzel, you know, Volkswagen. You know, if I started speaking German all of a sudden, a real German, not just that, you know, some of you might be like, hey, where'd you learn that from, Hanley? Did you buy Rosetta Stone? And I'd be like, no, I don't even know how to say hello, hello, goodbye, or where's the bathroom? Okay, I don't know. And so it would be a divine, supernatural miracle if I started preaching to you in German and the few people who could understand that could confirm, hey, he's praising God in a known language and we're blessed by that. But that's exactly what's happening in this passage. The earliest Christians began to manifest the miracle of speaking foreign languages, foreign tongues. And they were speaking languages like Arabic, Coptic, Parthian, Latin, and other dialects. Now I want, you to, I want you to notice down in verses 6 to 13 how the people respond to this supernatural manifestation of the Spirit. In verses 6 to 13, we see how the people respond. Notice that you're going to see that some of them were amazed. Others were confused and some began to mock. But here it is, Acts 2 verse 6. Look at verse 6. Each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Acts 2, verse 8. We each hear them in our own native language to which we were born. Acts 2, verse 11. We hear them in our own tongues. Clearly, these are intelligible languages. And verse 6 says, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, which means confused. That's a, that just means I'm bewildered, I'm confused, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So it says that they were in a house. Right? It says originally they were in some room, and we're going to assume that they're in some house. But somehow the activity of the Holy Spirit has moved them now into a public realm. Wherever they are, it's a public arena where people are noticing the sound of worship. They're hearing God being praised. These Jewish pilgrims are hearing God being praised in their native language. So you have two groups of people here. It's very important to distinguish. You have the believers who are empowered with the Holy Spirit, and you have the crowd who are being witnessed to. And so you have the believers, 120 of them, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and you have then the reaction of the crowd. And notice verse 7. Look at verse 7. It says, They were amazed and astounded, saying, Look, these people who are speaking our language, aren't these all Galileans? Aren't these all Galileans? Now, why would they say that? There was a stereotype, and I think it was a wrong stereotype. There was a stereotype that Galileans were unsophisticated and uneducated. They were dumb. You know, and, and so the truth is that most Galileans were bilingual. Most Galileans could speak Aramaic and Greek. And some Jewish Galileans were able to speak Hebrew. We know this because this is recorded in Jesus' ministry. And Jesus ministered primarily in the region of Galilee during his three years of earthly ministry. So his first group of believers, that 120, so that includes the disciples, you know, 11 of them, right, minus Judas, who betrayed Jesus, and, and the many who followed the disciples and truly believed in Jesus, the first 120 of them, they were Galileans. And, and the other Jews were like, aren't, aren't these Galileans? They're uns unsophisticated. How is it that they're speaking Latin and Coptic and Parthian? And it was a divine miracle. So this is why in verse 8, the crowd begins to respond, how is it that each of us can hear in his own language? Notice verse 9. Verse, verse, uh, starting in verse 9 and into verse 10, it begins to give you 
the regions where these people are from. And Luke's purpose here is not to be exhaustive, meaning Luke isn't giving you a list of every single country that Jewish pilgrims lived in. He's giving you a general representation of the Jewish diaspora for the purpose of witness. So verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. That's talking about Asia Minor, uh, not China. Okay, verse 10, uh, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, where they, sp they spoke Coptic, parts of Libya and near Cyrene, visitors from Rome where they spoke Latin, both Jews and proselytes. The word proselytes means uh, someone who converted to Judaism who's not ethnically a Jew. This is a Gentile who converted to Judaism. Verse 11, Cretans, and that's, uh, that's in, in, somewhere in, Greek, uh, in Greece, Arabs, and we hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. 120 of them, praising God. crowd was amazed. And verses 12 to 13 tell us further how they responded. Notice verses 12 to 13. Some of them were amazed, while others were confused. Verse 12 says, they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. Of course, they would be confused. Of course they would be confused because they have no idea what's going on. And in chapter 2, later, starting in verse 14, Peter gets up and he preaches. And we're going to come back to this in two weeks. And you're going to see this. Peter preaches and he explains it. Then he calls the people to repent. And he preaches to them and he explains what it is. So the word of God is necessary for them to understand the the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and notice in verse 13, it says, but others were mocking and saying, they're full of sweet wine. In other words, these people are drunk. I have never heard of people who get drunk and are able to all of a sudden speak a fluent foreign language. That would put Rosetta Stone out of business. I mean, there is, I've just, it's impossible. So clearly they're not drunk. Okay, clearly they're not drunk. The Holy Spirit was providing a symbol. This is what's happening. The Holy Spirit was providing a symbol of the gospel overcoming the barriers of location and language. The Holy Spirit was giving them a symbol of the gospel of Jesus Christ overcoming the barriers of location and language. Remember last week? I just want you to take your eyes and, and look over at Acts 1 verse 8. Remember last week we saw Jesus' mission for the church? Jesus' mission for his disciples? Jesus gave his disciples the mission to witness about him to the ends of the earth. The gospel would reach people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. The mission would begin in Jerusalem. It would spread to the ends of the earth. That's impossible. You ever wonder how it is that the gospel would pierce these boundaries okay Jesus you're telling us you're telling us to to bring the gospel but all we've known Jesus all we've known as devout Jews is that worship happens in Jerusalem in one central location and we worship in Hebrew so how is this going to happen where we're going to break through the language barrier and break through the location barrier and bring the gospel to the ends of the earth you see when when God says, this is going to be my mission, when Jesus says, this is, the church is going to grow, Jesus will also provide the power and the way for this to happen. And it just so happens that Pentecost, all these Jewish pilgrims who do speak these native languages, who live in these foreign lands, are going to hear Peter's sermon, they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're going to go back. And churches start in Rome apart from the Apostle Paul. Churches started in different places in Egypt. And so we know that this was part of the supernatural work of God. So location barrier, gone. Everyone's at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of it. Language barrier, gone. Why? Because the Holy Spirit filled the first 120 witnesses to speak in the native language of these Jewish pilgrims so that they could understand the gospel. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Let me give you a preview. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It records 
that 3,000, most of them, these Jewish pilgrims, became believers. They trusted their lives to Jesus Christ because of the work of the Holy Spirit through, through his supernatural witness and through Peter's preaching. And then later on it says that many more were added each day. And that's how the church began. The church began with 120 believers filled with the Holy Spirit. Then 3,000. And there you had the first church there in Jerusalem. Here you see a foreshadow of the church spreading across the world. A foretaste of believers worshiping in many languages. It's important for me to take some time, and this is why we need some time today, is to help you understand the difference between the gift of tongues here in Acts chapter 2 versus the gift of tongues recorded in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. It's very clear from our context and what we went through that the gift of tongues here in Acts chapter 2 refer to a public, earthly language. Right? So these were public, intelligible, earthly languages like German, French, Chinese, Spanish. These, these tongues did not require interpretation because clearly the people were amazed. It says they were amazed. These guys are speaking in our native tongue. We understand them. Interpretation was not necessary. It was a sign of the Spirit's arrival and a symbol of gospel mission overcoming the barriers of location and language. That's pretty clear. That's Acts chapter 2. This was a one-time event in history to start the church. They spoke tongues that were intelligible. This was this is the public use of tongues. Tongues in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, it refers to the private use of tongues. And in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 uh, chapter 12 uh, through 14, tongues refers to an unknown private heavenly language not for the purpose of evangelism because nobody understands them, but for the purpose of prayer. And tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 refers to the spiritual gift of speaking an unintelligible prayer language. Tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 requires the gift of interpretation to understand. You ready to see where Paul talks about this? Acts is written by Luke, but let's look what, what, what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, it says, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. See, that's very different from Acts chapter 2, where people were amazed by the manifestation of the Spirit because they understood the languages being spoken. But here is talking about this private prayer gift where no one understands, except for the person speaking maybe, if they also have the gift of interpretation. Notice 1 Corinthians 14, verses 13 and 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. So the Holy Spirit provides two gifts, the gift of tongues, this private, unintelligible, angelic, if you will, language, and the gift of interpretation where either yourself or someone else would be able to understand what it is, confirm that it's biblical, it be edifying, and the church in Corinth was blessed by that type of ministry. And we know that Paul had to correct the misuse of this gift. Right? Notice it says, therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. So the person could have the gift of tongues. If they don't have the gift of interpretation, they have no idea what they're uttering. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 27 and 28. It says, if any speaks in a tongue, let there only be two or at most three. And what you see practiced today uh, is that you have congregations where everyone's just going at it. And there's no interpretation going on. Right? So what you see a lot today is a misuse. A misuse of a biblical gift that was given. Right? So that's why it was, it was misused now. I mean, it's misused now. It was misused in Corinth. And that's why Paul writes this to correct them. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two or at most three. And each in turn, let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. 
Right? So it's very important that you don't confuse the two. The official position of SCBC Walnut, and you know, we talk about this all the time as a pastoral staff, it's more prevalent of something they deal with in the Mandarin congregation, not so much here in the English. But our position is that the gifts still exist for today, but they need to be exercised biblically. Rarely do we see them exercised rightly and biblically. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit can move through these manifestations today, uh, but they're often abused. Okay, and so we do believe that there are people who have these gifts, and if they can exercise them rightly, typically in a Baptist church like ours, typically it's going to be a private prayer language with interpretation. Okay, that's, that's typically people who have a gift of prayer at times are given this gift of tongues, and they're able to also have that gift of interpretation. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, position of our church. I will teach more about this in detail in our Sunday school class in November. Okay, but it's very important that we don't confuse the two. Because what happens is you have denominations, certain Pentecostal denominations. And I don't want to make a blanket statement because not all of them fall under this error. We want to be very gracious. But there are some Pentecostal denominations who misinterpret and they confuse what happened with Pentecost and, what, and the gift in 1 Corinthians. And this is what they teach. They, they do this. They say, look at Acts 2. Believers were saved. They follow Jesus. Then they received the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues. And so if you have the gift of tongues, that's proof that you're truly saved. That's proof that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so what they're doing is a categorical fallacy. They're messing up the two. You see, because what, what's happening in Acts chapter 2 was a one-time historical event, a one-time event for the purpose of the church starting and evangelism. What we see exercised biblically in certain churches today is the private prayer gift. Those are two different things. What happened in Acts chapter 2, every believer received those evangelism gifts for that moment, for that purpose, and for that time. What we see in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is that not every believer had these gifts. They had different gifts. The Holy Spirit gives every believer a unique set of gifts, and not all of them in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 speaks in tongues. And so we need to be careful. So the, the conclusion of this is that you do not need the gift of tongues for salvation. So if there are denominations that teach that if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit, and that means your salvation is not secure, that is something that you need to be that we want to caution you uh, to, to, to be careful about, because that is clearly not true. Okay? The Holy Spirit gives unique gifts to each and every person, and tongues is clearly not given to each and every person. I've never spoken in tongues. Uh, I don't think the Holy Spirit will give me that gift. Uh, I do have friends who uh, biblically practice this uh, in college, and so you know we talk and we, we, we bat this around, and, and so... Uh, I think for those of us who don't speak in tongues, I think we need to have a humility. Uh, we just have to have a humility to see uh, what the Spirit of God really is doing and to use the Bible as our guidelines for discernment. Okay? And so that's what I'll say now. I'll say more in Sunday school class. The central truth, the central truth of this morning's message is that the Holy Spirit empowers the church to overcome the barriers of location in language. We have several applications. Where does this application show up in our everyday lives? Where does this truth show up in our everyday lives? Well, one is that today we're going to commission, uh, after, after the offering, uh, we're going to commission two of our mission teams. And you do have the sheets here, okay? And so this is for you to pray throughout the week. We're going to commission our Panama team and our Kenya team. Do they face challenges? Yes, they're going to face challenges. Do we need to pray for our Kenya team? Absolutely. You know, are there things that happened in Kenya that, that cause us to fear? Absolutely. But we know from this passage that if the Holy Spirit, if God has called his people to do his work, he will empower them to carry out that work. And so our greatest weapon is the weapon of prayer, is that we pray and we lift up our teams. Not only do we send them out, but we keep praying for them as they go. Each and every day as they, we pray for them that the Holy Spirit would help them to break any barriers. Those barriers might be barriers of spiritual warfare. Those barriers might be physical barriers. Those barriers might be travel barriers. It may be persecution. But these barriers do not stand 
against the Holy Spirit when he wants his word to get out to his people, he will do whatever it takes, including supernatural manifestations, as we saw here in Acts chapter 2, of people speaking foreign languages for the sake of mission. The Holy Spirit works in that way. Okay, so please pray. That's one way that it shows up. When God calls you to do his work, he will empower you to do so. And the power of the Spirit transcends boundaries of location, language, barriers of sin, sickness. When you want to evangelize to someone, when you want to disciple your children, and you're facing barriers of rejection, it is not you that's going to be, over, be able to overcome those barriers. It is the Spirit speaking through you. Please pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. Even sickness and death itself, the Holy Spirit can overcome. The Bible is full of prescriptions for how we must live for God, whether it's a mission trip, uh, whether it's reconciliation in your marriage. But these things, if you want to do them for Jesus and for the glory of God, you cannot do them. You and I cannot perform these things in our own power. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit who can break boundaries and barriers that you and I would never imagine that we can do in our own power. Number two, how have people responded to the work of God in your life? How have people responded to God working through you and in you? When God changes your life for Jesus, when God begins to work through you in ministry, when God begins to use you to love on people in your workplace, in your schools, when God begins to use you as his instrument, there is no doubt that people will respond. People will have a reaction because it will become so evident. The Holy Spirit eventually, when he gets a hold of someone's heart, he begins to change you and I. And many of you have experienced this personally. And the natural response is that some people will accept you, some people will be amazed and interested, and they will want to pursue you and ask you about how this change came about, and you will have an opportunity to witness. Some, even in your family, will straight out reject you. There is no doubt that as the work of the Holy Spirit begins to impact you and change you from the inside out, people will recognize it, just as they did in Acts 2. It's not going to be some crazy thing like wind, okay? but people will recognize it. People will recognize the work of the Spirit in your life. It's the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about in Galatians. It is the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. Are you becoming more loving? Are your values changed? Are you becoming more patient, gentle? Do you have more joy? Do you have more self-control, etc.? You know, all the fruits of the Spirit. And as people begin to see that, you know, something that I experienced early on is that I had a set of friends that I had made early on. And it's, it's not that I rejected them. But slowly, the things that they wanted to do for leisure, I just couldn't join in. And as they found out I was called into ministry, slowly we began to drift, our values changed, and I began to lose friends. And that's going to happen to some of you. That's going to happen to some of you, and for some of you, it may even be your family members. As your values begin to change, because the work of God is evident in your life, and people recognize it, they may begin to pull away from you. So others will be drawn towards you. But you have the family of God, the body of Christ, to, that continues to grow with you. So we need not be discouraged when people respond negatively to the work of God in your life. Be encouraged because God has a purpose and we must trust him. Okay? So there's a lot more we can say. And a lot of what we talked about today is information. But when we talk about the Bible, information must become transformational. And what the Holy Spirit does, we're going to see in the in two weeks from now, is the Holy Spirit takes his word, which is information, biblical information, and when it's preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, it becomes and it leads to transformation. People's lives are changed, not because Peter preached from a book, but because Peter preached the Spirit-inspired word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit took that and it transformed people's lives, and it broke these barriers. The Holy Spirit empowers the church to overcome the barriers of location and language. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we praise you. We thank you for being an awesome and a great God. Lord, we want to come before you and ask that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, simply just to live each and every day for you. Lord, in our marriages, you know, our relationship with our parents, our relationship with coworkers, 
our relationship with others, the challenges that we face, barriers of evangelism, opportunities for outreach. Lord, I pray that you would grant these to us and that you would give us the power of your Holy Spirit to live for you and to live for your Son and to lead others to Jesus. We thank you. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.